Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. Man, I stand by mercy only. But I'm so glad to be able to commit my whole being into the care of, of one like him who gave himself, gave his son. The, the pain, the, the agony, the humiliation that he bore is what I should have. I should have been there. It was due to me. And he took it. Praise God. Praise God. I... I'm so glad to be able to just let go of all my efforts to try to become part of this incredible calling that he, that he has given us. Oh, man, just, just quit your trying and just give it all to Jesus. He is, a, he is an able Savior. He has all, he's able to save completely. God's able to save completely those who come to God by him, seeing he ever lives. I'll get that backwards, but anyway, it's Jesus. He was able to save completely those who call, those who come to God by him. Because he ever lives to pray. Aren't you glad, aren't you glad for that last part? Yes. You ever get in a low place and you're just, you just run out of gas spiritually and the devil's just hounding and, and uh, you just can't even hardly pray for yourself sometimes. And you just, there's a groan or you're just crying out. You know, even that groan is a, is a prayer. God's inspiring that. But you know somebody is praying for you? Sometimes it's down here. It needs to be down here. But there is somebody over there. Don't you know the devil would love to go up there and stop him? He can't get anywhere near that place. He can't stand the presence of God. But there is somebody right there who is conscious of your need at your weakest moment. And he's saying, Father, help them. You think about the love that he showed to Peter. He knew Peter was self-confident and cocky and thought he could handle everything and even warned him. You better be praying. Your flesh is weak. You're going to be in a, you're going to facing a battle here. You're facing a challenge. You're not ready for it. But what did he say? I've prayed for you. Before it ever happened, Jesus prayed for Peter. He didn't say, well, what's the matter with you? You're not going to do it yourself. I ain't going to mess with you. He said, I've prayed for you. I have prayed for you. I want you to get, wrap your mind around that. Remember, God, there, there's somebody praying for you that cares about you in your darkest moment. He probably let you get in that dark moment to, because he wants to, to bring you down to a place where you just let go of things. Anybody know what I'm talking about? God's kind of put you in places where you suddenly realize, hey, I, you know, this is ridiculous. I've got to... God's just constantly trying to put his finger on this, and I've got to just let it go. Let it go. What happened when you did? Peace. Oh, how we struggle. Oh, how attached we are to things of this world, to things of this life. And God is so faithful to work in us. But anyway, however, to the man who does not work but trusts God, and there's the, there is the, the two opposites. He's, he just gives up on the idea that I can do something that is going to help this process. I can work it out. I can try harder. I can do this. He gives up on, completely on that and goes over to the other side of the ledger. But I'm trusting you, Lord. I recognize that I can't, but I am trusting your promise. That's it. He justifies, however, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Praise God. If we haven't got somebody who can take us all the way and present us surely before God, then we have nothing in which to hope. I'll tell you, the devil will attack you in a thousand and one different ways to undermine your confidence and suppose that something's going to mess this up. If you have put your trust in him, you have put your trust in somebody who is a perfect, complete Savior. You suppose he's ever going to put his, turn his back upon you because you're weak? Oh, God. There's people who will, never, who will never humble themselves before him, and they will continually resist and say no and, I, and not believe. That's one thing. 
But, oh, God, every one of us is weak. If you think you're strong, you just don't know. God's got some major work to do on you. If you got to the place where you begin to recognize, I'm weak and I need a Savior. I need him this day. I do not have what it takes to serve him, to live this Christian. I simply don't have it. You are in a glorious place. You're in a wonderful place. It doesn't feel like it, but it's wonderful to be able to let go and, and say, Lord, I need you. But you know the thing that's, that just really, you know, was made real to me afresh is the simple fact that this principle by which men enter into salvation, letting go, letting Christ take over the job of, of washing away sins and imparting life, those who give in that job, the principle is the same for the way we live our Christian life. How many of us try to get in the door and then, my God, we're going to do it now? It doesn't work. And man, I discover that all the time. But praise God. So anyway, he goes, uh, he talks about the blessedness of all this. He goes into the issue of uh, who is this talking about? Is this... Uh, what's the place of the law in all of this? And he says, every provision, basically, I'll summarize, every provision of the law, everything was embodied in the law, came later than what happened with Abraham. So Abraham has already become a righteous man because he believes the promise of God. Later on, the law comes in, so obviously it's not through the law, is it? Is that plain? That's absolutely plain. He's a righteous man. The law comes later. It serves a temporary purpose, but it has nothing to do with attaining righteousness. Okay? All right, so then he is the father of all them who believe. Now he's talking about the people that are under the law and those who aren't. He, okay, let me see. Let me come down to verse 13. I want to get past some of this. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world. Now, have you ever connected the dots here with, with what he says in, in chapter 8 about us being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ? Let's go back to the time of Abraham. And God is absolutely starting something. He has an, this eternal purpose and part of this eternal purpose is calling a man out and basically declaring, you are my heir. I have a kingdom that is way beyond all of this, and you are the heir. You and your, you and your descendants are heirs. You get that? So here, that's what he's talking about. He's not saying you are going to inherit this world. I don't want this world, do you? That's not a good inheritance. Rather, he's saying you, out of all the men in this world, you're the heir. But not just you, it's those that are your descendants. Now, who are they? You know, you got a lot of folks that just put a lot of stock in being physically descended from Abraham. That doesn't mean a thing. Not by itself. Some of them, thank God, are also born of Abraham's faith. They believe just like Abraham did. But there's, there's plenty of others. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless. Because law brings wrath. Why does law bring wrath? Well, why, you know, why does just imposing law on us, why does that automatically result in wrath? Because we can't keep it. Our nature is lawless. All it does is expose that fact. So if God just dumps commandments on us, that automatically, just it says night follows day, wrath follows law. That's why God deals with us in the, on the basis of what he did through the cross. Another way, thank God. And where there is no law, there's no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace. See, now you've got God's energy, God's very being, God's help coming to the rescue of people who are totally helpless in ourselves. We're believing, and as a result of believing the promise of God, something is entering into us that we didn't have before. You get that? I need it, don't you? 
The promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Now he's going to get to it. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. So you see what God was doing in starting a family. He calls Abraham. You said, you're my heir. But that inheritance was passed down to everyone who has also come to God based upon that same principle of faith. I believe we got some heirs of God this morning. Joined heirs with Jesus Christ. I pray that if you're not, you will hear his call. And realize what the real deal is, where this world is headed, where it is called, and hear the call of his heart to turn your back upon that and put your, repent of your sins, put your faith in Christ. Believe his promise. And his promise is all about stuff that you and I can't do, isn't it? Can you get rid of your sins? Can you make yourself holy and righteous? Can you make yourself glorious? Some of you can barely put on your makeup. Some of us just muddle along without it. <laughs> no, we have no power to do any of these things, but God has promised. That's the essence of it. We have a promise of a God who cannot fail. That's the foundation. The question is, are we willing to commit our, our entire being to that promise and to believe it? As it is written, I have made you, I have made you a father of many nations. How did, how did he get to be, that, to be that? God did it. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls those things that are not as though they were. Now, connect the dots again. What did he say in, in chapter 8? Whom he called, he justified. And all, and let me, I better go back and read it. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Isn't that a God who calls things that are not as though they were? That's what he's talking about. I've already done all this. I'm calling you to a sure thing in Christ. Praise God. Does your uh, path look a little bleak right now? Have you been harassed? Have you been, have you been struggling? Anybody here has not been? Yeah. It's, it doesn't look like this is, all, any of this is going to happen a lot of the time. It doesn't feel like it. But we are not called to go by those things. We are called to continually come back to the promise. Praise God, because we have a God who is able to call things that are not. You can't see them, you can't feel them, you can't touch them as though they were. Praise God. That affects every aspect of our lives in Christ. That affects what you and I do and how we think and how we act and react this morning. We have a God who's able to take that impossibility in your life and mine right now. And he has a promise that that will change. That they have The process, the call that he has that he has engineered in our lives, it will happen. Praise God. And that's why he says, against all hope, does everything feel like it's against that hope in you this morning? Are you, are you so buried in where you're at and how you're feeling and, the, and how things look that you can't lay hold of this and you can't, suddenly it just doesn't seem like it's, maybe it doesn't mean me, maybe, you know, and just the negative thoughts begin to come in. Oh, God. I don't want to listen to that junk, do you? Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed. Now, we know from the record Abraham didn't do it perfectly. He had his bobbles. He had his times when he kind of tried to engineer his own solution. He, he kind of went this way and, kind of, and he showed his weakness. He showed his humanity. But there was one bottom line with Abraham that needs to be our bottom line. He believed God. When it came down to it, he just surrendered and said, all right, Lord, you said it. That's good enough for me. I put my faith in what you said. That's it. Folks, if that's where your faith is this morning, it's going to be okay. It is going to be okay. God's going to bring you through. 
Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. God is calling us to, against all hope, believe that you and I will one day stand before him in glory. Don't look at me that way. I know it doesn't feel like it. I know it doesn't look like it. But we are called, it didn't look like a day, Abraham, either. He reached a point in his life where he couldn't father children. And, he, and Sarah certainly couldn't have any. She'd gone way past the point where it was even humanly possible to bear a child. Does that stop God? No. no. Obviously, we can look back and we see the end of the story. We don't have any sweat about it at all. No stress. We know the story. We know how the story turns out. But Abraham lived for years and years not knowing it's other than the fact, well, God, you said it. I believe it. You're the, you're the God of heaven and earth. I know what you're like in a measure, and I simply believe. I, I'm trusting you, Lord. You, you can do what I can't. That principle applies to me this morning. God is able to do what I cannot do in me. And he's the only one that can engineer the solutions that you and I need in our lives right now. And we are called to the same faith that Abraham was called to. To stand in faith and to just believe God in the face of everything and say, Lord, I just, I give it, I give it over to you. You know, sometimes we go through different stages in, in you know, learning how to walk in faith. You know, one of the stages, of course, is uh, trying to do it yourself continually trying to beat your head against a wall and do the impossible, change yourself. And God has a way of just bringing you down and just continually showing you, no, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. And we go round and round and round until we finally say, all right, Lord, I get up. You're right, I can't. But then there's another side, there's another ditch you can fall into and that ditch is, okay, God, you said you're going to do it. So we go to sleep and say, all right, God, just do it. We throw down all our, uh, we, we, we quit trying, we quit doing anything. We just say, all right, Lord, I'm just going to lay here in my easy chair. Wake me up when it's over. I'm going to wake up in glory and you, you will have done it all. I had no part, no part to play. You think it's that way? No. Of course it's not. You know, I'm, some of you will remember the... Uh, you know, years and years ago now, it's really receding into history almost, but, you know, when the Lord was delivering Judy. And they reached a point where it seemed like they were just kind of beating their heads against the wall, trying to help her. They'd cast out the devils, they'd come back in, cast out the devils, they'd come back in. And finally, the Lord showed them what was going on. See, so that Judy wasn't putting forth any effort. And so they began to encourage her. You know, there really is a divine partnership in this Christian life. Just because we are unable doesn't mean we don't do. It just means that we, we, hitch, our, we hitch our wagon to, a, to the real source of power and not to the one that we think we have. We act, but we act with an expectation and in accordance with the promise of God, and we expect Him to supply the help and the energy. And I, you know, I've been through this this week, so this is real fresh. The Lord wanted me to experience something so that I could tell you about it. And uh, so in case you ever hear about anybody that experiences some of this, you'll know what to tell them. Come on, you're supposed to laugh a little louder than that. <laughs> oh, my. This is, these are such easy things to fall into. But there's such a simplicity in just believing God, trusting Him with the issues that face us now. You think of, that's what Abraham had to do. That's what faith in the promise translated into. Lord, I trust you right where I'm at. I don't see anything. I don't see anything happening. I, you're allowing me to just kind of go on. It seems every day is kind of like the same, and yet it doesn't seem like anything's happening, but I'm still trusting you, Lord. Do you trust God with the issues that are part of your life right now? Can you, let, can you accept the fact that he is working in you and allowing things that are happening in your life 
Can you trust him with them? Or are you going to be like Abraham and said, well, the Lord's not going to fulfill this promise. It looks like I got to do it. And so, you know, how he engineered bringing forth a son by Hagar. And all that brought was trouble. But I'll tell you what, God is so faithful. God didn't throw him out, did he? God's not going to throw you and me out. I'm so glad because I have walked in, I've fallen in these ditches so many times, it's, it's ridiculous. And he hasn't thrown me out. And he continues to come back so lovingly, so patiently. And he reaches his hand down and says, all right, let's try this again. Let's get, let's get on the rock. Let's get back on the, on the path here. I've given you a promise. I'm making you like my son. I want you to trust me with the things that I let happen in your life. I want you not only just trust me, but thank me. Recognize that it's my love that's allowing these things. Do you feel especially weak? Is there something that's weakening you right now? Can you just say, thank you, Lord? Because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. If, you, if I let you just feel, feel your oats, you wouldn't th you'd think you didn't need me. But I love you. But right now, what I'm calling you to do is to con continue to trust my promise, continue to look to me, continue to put it all in my hands, just like Abraham did, just like you entered the kingdom. This is the same way we walk. Lord, your promise is that you will help me today with this issue and that I can get up in the morning tomorrow and I can be further down the path if I just trust in you. And even if it doesn't feel like I'm further down the path, Lord, I'm just going to stand in faith. I'm going to receive that your hand that works in me today and let you change me. I'm going to recognize that I need changing. Lord, break down the resistance of my will in all of this. Break down that pride that stands in the way. Help me just to come to that place where I just stretch forth my hands and say, Lord, I need a Savior, and you're the only one around. I'm putting my hope and I trust in you this day. And I know that you're going to bring me through because you are able and I am not. Is that this relevant to anybody here? Yeah. And you know, of course, the, the issue is that we don't, none of this happens in a vacuum, does it? We've got an enemy of our souls who is scared to death that we'll get some of this. He is going to do everything in his power. He is doing everything in his power to oppress minds and hearts and to, and to fill us with fear, fill us with unbelief. What is our defense? What is our defense? Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that these same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren in the world. That's from, second, from 1 Peter 5, isn't it? Be a good scripture to, to get to. Because he says, be self-controlled and alert in verse 9. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. Well, what's the foundation of faith? It's the word of God. If the devil is oppressing your mind with something, he is going to be lying to you and to me about something. What he is telling you will be contrary to what God's word says, and I'm going to stand on what God says. If he says something and you sort of entertain that, what you're saying is, well, maybe God's word isn't really true after all. Maybe I can trust the devil more than I can trust God. Seriously? Resist him standing firm in the faith because you, why? Because you know your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Now, connect this to all what we've read. And the God of all grace, not the God of some grace, not the God of a little bit of help here and there, the God of all grace, everything we need, he freely gives us all things, Romans chapter 8, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That's a pretty good promise. Man, I'm about to be encouraged by that. Thank God. Oh, you see our part and you see his part. Our part is to hold steady in the boat and believe and obey and act like we believe him. 
and, and stand firm and resist and fight this good fight of faith. We've got our part to play, but it's not to earn it. It's simply to walk in harmony with it and to, and to be believers in the promise of God. And I'll tell you, we, will, we who stand in that and have been called to it, we will inherit all of this because of him. Amen. It's not because we deserve it. It's because of his promise and his grace toward us. Thank God. And that's why he, he concludes that with verse 11, to him, to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Well, I need some encouragement this week. I've certainly been, you know, in this ditch and in that ditch and, and hopefully coming to the point where, you know, it's not like, you know, first you try, then you say, okay, God, you're just going to have to do it. I'm not even going to try. And, of course, the devil comes in and, and you just, just lay there and take it. That doesn't work. No, now we've got to get up on our hind legs and act like children of faith and believe his promise. And I'll tell you, there's going to be energy come in. There's going to be strength come in. It's not from us. It's his promise. It's, what he, it's part of those all things that he freely gives. He is not going to stop short of fulfilling his purpose for everyone that puts their trust in him. And I want to be one of those, and he's going to get the glory. Praise God. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time. And may God richly bless you until then.